Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, our next segment is with Sean Wang. He was formerly in the finance business world, but he switched over to coding and software development. So please give a warm welcome. And without further ado, here is Sean Wang. Um, hey, everyone. <laughs> hey, Alondra. Hey, Catherine. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. This is fun. I, uh... I always have. I've never had a chance to speak to, uh, you know, uh, young, younger people like yourself. So I'm excited to see what happens here. <laughs> yeah, this is what it's all about. You know, um, learning from firsthand experiences from experienced people like you, and just hearing about it, so we know how it's going to be in real life. You know. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if you want to do a quick introduction before we go straight into the Q and A. So my name is Sean. I'm originally from Singapore. I moved to the U.S. for college, uh, and I spent around about six years in finance, and then I switched to tech uh, as a career change at age 30. Um, so I have a fair amount of regrets as to picking the wrong career for myself, but uh, we'll talk about that later on. Um, I spent some time at Two Sigma in New York City, and then went remote, worked at Netlify.com and then moved to Amazon Web Services, so, so AWS, and now I'm at a startup. Uh, where I'm head of developer experience at temporal.io. So that's my brief background. Awesome. Thank you so much. Did you just dab? <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw this. I was like, what? <laughs> I noticed earlier that my camera is a bit laggy. I don't know if it's just on my end, but I noticed earlier. So apologies. To Are you that. sure you didn't dab? Are you just trying to cover it up? Are you just trying to like be slick about it? It's okay, Alondra. We know the truth. It was, it was a clap. I, I don't think I know how to do a dab, if I'm being honest. Whoops. <laughs> Skip that part of the trends. Um, anyway, again, thank you for being here. Um, so one of our first questions, actually, we can start off with what you just said. You said you have some regrets about your initial career. Um, do you mind telling us what you studied in college, actually? Yeah. Uh, so I went to uh, UPenn, Wharton, the, the Wharton Business School, and I studied finance. Um, so I, you know, when I, when I was in high school, I just straight up just applied to the most prestigious, you know, just like okay, US New World or whatever the banking is and just applied there without really a second thought. Um, and I thought that finance people kind of ruled the world. Like if you know how money works, then, then you'll never go, go broke, I guess. <laughs> um, and I just had it fixated in my mind. So that's, that's the sole intention that I had when going to, to college. Uh, and then after graduating from college, working my way up through investment banking and hedge funds um, until I was on a small team of three people running a billion dollars of uh, allocated capital. And we can talk about that, but uh, you know, there, there are some downsides to that. And I realized that my personality just wasn't a good fit for finance. And I, it took me too long to own up to that when I thought I was just not trying hard enough. Yeah, that motive's like super understandable. And that was a really insightful answer. Thank you. So I actually believe that your finance background has helped your career as a developer, or was it just a completely new start? It helped. Um, so there, there are a few ways in which it helped. So the, the first way, which, which I think is always going to be forever going to be true for the rest of my life is that I view everything as a form of investment, right? Like uh, if, even if I'm not investing my money, I'm investing my time. Uh, and at the end of the day, time's the most limited resource that we have. So I really have to be conservative, especially if I wasted it on the first career. The second way in which it was helpful was in the transition. So when I realized that I probably wasn't going to be cut out for finance, I actually took a, uh, a year, sort of like a gap year, where I was not in finance, but I, I joined. Uh, so I was, uh, I was a customer of a startup that was trying to replace Bloomberg. Bloomberg is one of the biggest uh, software. It's like Slack plus Wall Street Journal plus uh, like a quote machine all rolled into one, one device that you pay like $30,000 a year for. And, and every single one, every, every person in finance has one. Um, so if a startup comes along and, and, and threatens to replace that, you take a serious look at that startup. So I joined that startup going from customer to employee and I stuck it out for a year trying to dip my water, dip my toe into... Into, into tech and realizing that I wanted to do more of it. And then I quit and learned to code. Um, 
So finance can help serve as a stepping off point if you have some skill to trade in, in exchange for another skill, which is what I was doing for that one year. Um, and then after I went through my boot camp, I came out of the boot camp and I got, I told that story of like, okay, I was an ex finance person and now I've learned how to code uh, and I can be useful to you this way. And that's how I got picked up by two Sigma in New York city. Um, they ended up completely not at all using my finance career, career whatsoever. They were just only using my developer side. Uh, but it's a story that you can tell to get the job. And once you get the job, uh, then you can pivot that into like, okay, now I'm a developer and I've been, uh, you know, working a working developer for a while. Uh, now I'm qualified to, to apply to other developer jobs. So getting from that zero to uh, having some experience is, is the hardest part, as I'm sure everybody knows. Like you kind of need experience to get experience at, and that's sort of that old chestnut. Um, and one way to do it is kind of to trade in experience. Like it's like, oh, here's my used experience. Uh, give me some store credit for the next one. Okay, that's actually really cool. Um, going off that story that you said that you mentioned, um, you said that you went to, in in high school, you were really focused on like finance and you went to college knowing that you wanted to do finance. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about that and then what happened that you said, mm, let's go to coding? I just read about all these people like, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, George Soros, um, people who just really understood economics better than politicians, better than, uh, you know, the, the regular talking heads that you see on TV um, and that they had skin in the game, right? Like they're not just saying uh, some kind of point of view. They put their money where their mouth is. And if they were wrong, they would have been ruined. Um, but they were right and they got paid for it. That, that seemed like the ultimate meritocracy to me. Um, and I thought that I, I wanted to be one of those. You know, I, I wanted to be smart enough that I could understand the market. So, and, so I would never have to really uh, survive a recession, I mean, suffer a recession again, right? Because if you can see a recession coming, you can sort of uh, position yourself so that you profit instead of lose money with, with everyone else. Um, so that was the thesis. And then, and then I went into school and I, and I was with like, you know, the top business minds in America and none of them saw the, the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Uh, and and it, it got pretty hard, but then I was like, and I was already suspecting myself of like not actually being uh, a very good at finance or be that interested. In it. Uh, but I just persisted because if you already you already got the degree, then you're like, ah, oh, I mean, you know, I have the degree. Like it'd be a waste if I just pivoted. So so then I followed through with six more years of working in the field that uh, that wasn't like I wasn't amazing, but you know, and it and it you know I, I did have some good times. Uh, some some of my favorite jobs and my favorite coworkers were from there, uh, but at the end of the day, it wasn't my life's work, uh, and I have to realize that. And you know, so I think a lot of people, there's a lot of pressure to like have a consistent story. Like, oh, when I was born, like I was you know made for this, and you just tell that story the whole way until you're you know 60. But I don't. I think a lot of people's lives are made more non-linear than they let on. Right. Um, so when you hear people's success stories, they often leave out the parts that are, you know, where they went off the trail for a little bit and they came back on. Um, so I, I, I would like to be, you know, more honest and open to you guys because um, I think the reality is most of us are like that. Uh, we, we, we struggle to find our way even when we're 30. You know, I'm 35 now and uh, I, I only think I got it, but, you know, ask me again in five years. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, that, especially to a room full of like very, like indecisive high schoolers, we don't know what we want to do, but you know, the college admissions process, they ask us for like one coherent narrative. So yeah. you said yeah. that you didn't have the type of personality for finance. Could you clarify what, what type of personality do you think okay. is the right fit for finance? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if um, I may have, I don't know if I'm exactly, I don't know exactly what I mean when I say personality. So uh, I'll just put it this way. So I was in a uh, multi-manager market neutral equity hedge fund. So what we do is we uh, we buy and short stock uh, trying to generate pure alpha. So uh, our investments are not supposed to go up and down with the general market. They're just supposed to make money on an absolute basis, no matter whether the market goes up or down. Uh, so you, you try to find uh, the spreads between stocks and you, you, want, to, you want to see things that correlate but uh, grow apart over time. So uh, you profit from the, from the difference between them. Um, the problem was that uh, the the risk drawdowns were very tight. So, for example, if we lost like two percent of our uh, of, of our capital, our AUM would be cut in half, 
And then if another 2%, it'll be cut in half again and uh, like a couple more and you'd be out of a job. Um, so it'd be, it, it was pretty challenging, especially when I remember one, one case where I was, uh, I was actually short Skechers. Um, and, uh, and Skechers was on this like tear because it was suddenly relevant again because um, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't cool for a while. And then they, they started doing some promos and they had some new form factors and whatever. You, you kids know what's going on with Skechers. Uh, but I, I sure did not. And uh, they, they like ripped like 16% up on, on one day. And uh, we lost quite a lot of money on that day. Um, and like it was, it, was, it was a very stressful job. Like, you know, four times a year, a, company, a public company will announce earnings and, and, the, and, and the stock moves a lot on that day. So you, you end up spending a lot of time stressing out about not just what the company is going to do, uh, but also how the rest of the market is positioned because it's, it doesn't really matter just the results. It also has to match up against expectations. In, so if, expe if the results are great, but the expectations were even higher, then it actually underperforms, right? Because the, the expectation is already built in. So it's a kind of like a poker game when you're looking at everyone else and you're like, okay, like I have a view on the, on the fundamentals, but then now I also have to care about what everyone else thinks. And it becomes this really stressful like ladder where you just con constantly doubt yourself. Um, so basically in my breaking point was that one point where uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, I had a big position on the next day and I was, I had a, uh, nightmare the night before, and uh, I started having heart palpitations, and I realized that uh, if I had a heart attack and died in my sleep uh, doing this job because it was so high stress, um, I might be making a lot of money, but I would not be having much of a life to to spend it on. So that's when I was like, okay, I don't think I'm cut out for this. Um, I, I have other friends who are amazing at it, uh, and it just took me that long to realize that I probably wasn't one of them. Thank you for that answer. Honestly, I think it's really important for everyone to see that it's not so cut and dry. So thank you for being so honest with us. Um, <laughs> kind of on that same track, um, just kind of you're, you're talking about a lot of um, struggles with that and like how you were really stressed out. Um, now that you've switched gears, um, do you have like a favorite part of your job now that just like maybe it's a little bit distressing maybe or maybe it doesn't even feel like a job at all or it's still there yeah it's the, it's the community so i'll talk about the difference between finance and tech right finance is a very closed um it's a very zero-sum game so if i know something i'm incentivized not to share it right because then that that creates a competitor with me uh whereas tech is quite open in this in a, in a sense that like I don't lose anything. In fact, I gain something if I find if I make a discovery and I share it with everyone else, uh, because then they, most of them will credit me, uh, or they'll improve upon what I did. And that's what I find with with tech now in, in my career, which is like I, I openly share stuff that I learn. Um, we are invited to conferences to share stuff that we learn, and that's perfectly normal. And that's and super not normal in tech. Uh, sorry, that's that's very not normal in finance. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm much enjoying this default open position now uh, because it helps me make, uh, you know, build a network um, while getting better at my craft. Um, and I, I just find it much more fulfilling and long lived. So the other thing about finance is that uh, it's kind of like a black hole of ideas. And, and to be clear, this is the only in the specific part of finance that I was in. So I was in uh, market neutral hedge funds. If you if you are in private equity, if you're in uh, venture capital, it might it might be a completely different story because they play much longer term games. But we were playing very short term games. So I would have a trade idea, and whether or not it made money, uh, by the time the trade idea was over, it was gone forever. It was is no longer relevant, right? Um, and that sucks because then you need to come up with idea after idea after idea, and and hope that your magic doesn't break. If uh, and some people do, you know, they they have really good runs, and then and then for some reason they just lose it. Uh, and that's because it's completely out of their control. I think whereas in tech, you're incentivized to build long-term games that compound over time because you're building upon technology that is that like every time you run the proof, you run the code, whatever, it comes out with the same result, right? It's not going to fundamentally change overnight just because market expectations changed. Um, so it's more it's closer to ground truth in a way, um, and it's much it's a much better foundation to build a career on because. Um, well, at least this is this is purely subjective, by the way, just because of how I turned out. But uh, <laughs> it's a much better foundation to build a career on because you can compound. The thing that I worked on last year helped me this year, and the thing I work on this year helps me in the next year. And that doesn't happen as much for finance. 
uh, it happens a lot more in tech. And and I think if you apply that for 40 years, however long your career want, you want your career to be, I think you can go very far with that, uh, a long-term mentality. That's a beautiful answer. Like, honestly, that's <laughs> such a beautiful way to look at tech, that it's collaborative instead of competitive, and oh, that yeah. uh, reaching out and helping people can actually really make an impact and help you as well. So more on tech, what was... What's a memorable tech project that you've worked on? Oh God, there's so many. <laughs> um, do you guys want? Do you guys know what Hacker News is? Um, Hacker Can News, no review. <laughs> okay, so Hacker News is is the de facto community water cooler, right? Like it's where, it's where we all gather. Um, maybe you know Reddit. Um, so it's so Reddit is kind of hack. So Hacker News is. Reddit for developers. Um, so if you really specifically want to go into software engineering, you should be on there because everyone else is. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like our top, you know, uh, news aggregator. Really, that's all it is. People submit stuff and then we vote on it. You know, and, and then every day there's like a list of top ten, you know, links and stuff like that. It's very simple, um, but uh, it's a mark of pride if if you make something or you write something that that makes it to the top of Hacker News. Um, and this is. It probably drives something on the order of six million views a day. Um, so, and, and so, if you work for a company and you you want to launch a project, you want if you launch on the Hacker News and it gets it gets some traction there, uh, you get a lot of visitors just who, who who maybe never have heard about you. So that's free marketing, right? Like, so that's that's a really good thing. Uh, so probably one of my most impactful projects is I worked on Netlify Dev. Uh, so Netlify is is the company I used to work at. It's a site that uh, helps you basically get up and running. Like you push. Uh, in, in like an HTML, CSS, and JavaScript project to Git onto GitHub, uh, and it just deploys onto a, a live site for you that you can that you can share around and, and hook up a domain and all that fun stuff. Like all this used to require a lot of uh, configuration. Like you'd have to SSH into a box and and set up all, a, a bunch of configuration, uh, but now it's just automatically provided to you as a service, mostly for free, uh, and that's a pretty awesome thing. The problem comes when you're trying to develop stuff and you don't have it locally. So uh, you, you keep having to push it up to the cloud every single time. Um, and that, that tends to be slow, especially for large sites. So the, the innovation in Netlify Dev is uh, we would basically take the cloud environment, compile it down to WebAssembly, and run it locally. Uh, so even, even our proprietary code, we, we just compiled it and, and let you run it uh, on your machine. Uh, and so that would let you iterate much quicker and, and test before you deploy to, to our cloud. Um, so yeah, that was one of the most upvoted um, developer tools projects of 2019. And I was the, the main engineer on it uh, together with my CEO. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was huge. Um, you know, I won't take full credit for it just because obviously my CEO had the idea. I was just kind of executing on his vision. Uh, plus, when you get upvoted on projects, sometimes you just receive credit for like stuff you did in the past. Like they're just like, oh, Netlify, I'm going to upvote, you know? Um, so it's not, ex like, they're not upvoting the project. They're just upvoting the company if they like you. Um, so, so definitely we, we benefited from a bunch of tailwinds there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's an impactful project uh, and it, it spawns a, a number of clones by, by our competitor companies. And that's great because it improved the developer experience of a lot of uh, real engineers. That's honestly super cool. Wow. I mean, we always hear these success stories, but you know, to hear you talking about like how you actually got there is really, really cool. Do you mind if you um, repeat that, um, like the Reddit for developers that you were talking about? Yeah. So, so if you're familiar with Reddit, Reddit's kind of uh, a general purpose forum for all, all topics, right? You can uh, talk about Wall Street bets, or you can talk about pets, or you can talk about, you know, high quality memes or whatever. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I was I was a moderator of uh, R slash React JS, which is the the React subreddit. If you, if you want to learn front end development, you, you probably want to learn React. And uh, I was I was he heavily involved for for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, Hacker News is a special purpose Reddit that only is dedicated to you know software engineering topics. Uh, that has a different community because they only go there for software engineering stuff. Uh, Reddit has Reddit tends to swamp swamp you with like a whole bunch of like unrelated topics in the feed. So you might you might be looking at cute stuff, you might be looking at politics, you might be looking at like guns. I I, I don't know, you know, what, whatever you're interested in. Um, but 
Hacker News tends to be heavily moderated to stay on focus. Uh, so that's a, that's what a lot of people like. Um, and uh, but there's good and there's bad, right? That there are a lot of cranky people on on there because it's uh, anonymous. Um, so you get mean comments, and you got to kind of got to take it together with the good stuff. Um, really quick, it's just Hacker News, right? So H A C K E R yeah. News. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, right, it's at news.ycombinator.com. There's there's a there's a broader history to this. So Y Combinator is a uh, startup accelerator founded founded by Paul Graham. It's it's one of the it is the most successful uh, startup accelerator in history. That's that's behind. It's funded Reddit itself. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's older than Reddit, and uh, it's also funded like Coinbase, Airbnb, Dropbox, like Stripe, like just every every new and up and coming company that you've heard of uh, has been has gone through Y, y Combinator. So. Part of the reason they, they they run this forum is to get you to register that they're so by association. If you ever want to start a startup, you should go to them, right? Uh, <laughs> there's always a strategy. There's always like it. People don't run this stuff for free. There's always an end game there. Always, mm -hmm. yeah. Um. So, all right, going back. I'm so sorry. Um, you're you said you studied finance in um, college. Um, now, knowing what you know between the differences, would you go back and change that? Would you go straight into... Uh, that's the question, right? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. Yes, I would. Uh, so Penn was the uh, has a very strong computer science program uh, where they, you know, they, they created like the ENIAC computer. Um, and uh, there's the, 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 uh, some of my classmates were involved in some of the earliest self-driving car projects uh, that won the DARPA challenges that eventually became uh, Waymo and, um, you know, the, the Tesla self-driving car projects. Um, and I could have got involved. I saw those self-driving cars and I was like, these nerds, they're, they're just working on toys. And I just walked off and went to my finance class, right? Like, <laughs> what do I know, right? These guys paying getting paid millions of dollars and, and, and uh, I'm a chump. Um, yeah, so, so absolutely, I would have taken that path if I knew it. But um, you know, part of life is that you you make mistakes and you don't regret them because there's there's not nothing good can come out of that. Um, but I think I definitely think that um, maybe something I would pass on to my high school self is don't get too locked in to what you think you want because you don't know Jack <laughs> right now. Um, so like, listen to to the stories of other people. Listen to the uh, and if you think you really love a, 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 a an industry because like you've just heard good stuff about it. Uh, maybe just that's just because people haven't told you the bad stuff. They, 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 they don't, you, you haven't listened to the open and honest conversations where they tell you about the bad stuff, right? Uh, because a lot of people when they do interviews, especially on on like NPR or like you know the, the, some of the top outlets, they only tell you the good stuff because they're trying to you know present a good image of themselves, and and that's fair. Um, but as a as someone picking a life path for yourself, you might want to know the full picture. Yeah, it's really insightful. And so since you're talking about, you know, hearing about all the bad stuff as well as the good stuff, what would you say is some of the bad stuff about <laughs> the tech industry? <laughs> Hitting you're you very the sharp. I like, that. I like that. Good call, Catherine. Um, <laughs> so honestly, uh, there's there's a fair amount of... Um, oh, my God. There's, there's, there's just... Where do I start? <laughs> okay, I, I will say that it's very good. So I mean, that's why I'm still in this, right? Uh, I, I would not uh, come here and tell you otherwise. To start. Okay, starting yeah, yeah, strong. Exactly. Okay. Um, so we don't know how to measure productivity. We do not. Is it lines of code? Is it number of hours spent? Because uh, I can spend a long time writing writing code and then coming out with completely useless stuff. Um, and because we don't know how to measure productivity, we don't know how to pay people. Uh, we don't know how to manage people. Um, and there are a lot of people, there are a lot of theories on how we might do it. Uh, and there are a lot of successful companies where you know, engineering managers will come out of the, a successful company and say, like, this is how we did it at Uber. Therefore, it is the right way because Uber is successful. Therefore, if you adopt what I did, then you will be successful. Uh, but there's a logical flaw there, which is, like, would it have been successful anyway without you? Um, and nobody ever questions that, <laughs> or because there's no counterfactual, right? You just get one shot, and 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 um, a lot of the industries run that way, right? We'll look at 
some successful practice from Netflix and go like, yeah, Netflix knows how to do that. Why, why don't we be more like Netflix? Because Netflix is successful. Uh, if we, and this is called cargo calling, right? Like we import the practices of another uh, company because they say it was successful for them uh, without reala really realizing if it was that was the real cause or if we're anything in a situation like them uh, that is transferable. There's all these really hard questions to answer, which no one really has the time for because we're all too busy trying to churn out products. <laughs> um, so there's that, you know, that the the whole the whole question of uh, does anything that we do make it mean anything? Obviously, some of it does, but it's very hard to know. There's a, there's a saying in medical school that half of what they teach you, and mind you, this is medical school. It's like it's it's science. Half of what we teach you is going to be wrong. We just don't know which half. So you got to learn the whole thing, and keep in mind that some of this might be wrong. Um, similar, similarly to psychology, like there's a whole replication crisis. Google this, by the way, if you're taking notes, replication crisis. A lot of things that we think we, we've taken for a fact, like the Stanford uh, prison experiment, um, like the, the marshmallow experiment that people might hear about, there's a lot more nuance than, than in the popular culture. Uh, and people are re-examining these, these, these fundamental beliefs in their industry and discipline and <laughs> realizing that it's built on a very shaky foundation. Anyway, not to not to give you existential crises, but uh, software has that as well. Um, so there's other there's other stuff like uh, there's all there's all this uh, th there's there's a lot of fights uh, with t within the software in industry, um, which are very which get very ugly. Um, there are a lot of I mean I'll, I'll say I'll say this right here like um, so if you look at the charts I, I mean and, and you, <laughs> uh, you know I'm talking to, to to two young women right now. If you look at the charts of people graduating in law, medicine, uh, 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 computer science, and I think architecture, like high paying white collar jobs, right? Computer science is the only one where people just drop off. Uh, women just drop off, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I, I wish I, had, I could share the chart with you right now, but we can't because it's a stream yard. But just go look it up. Like the percentage of acceptance, uh, percentage of graduation rates uh, in, uh, sorry, percentage of women graduating in each field uh, over time for these for these top four professions and looking at the precipitous drop in computer science compared to the other fields and explaining what happens there. And that's just graduating from college. And then in the industry, the percentage of women uh, around in, in the software industry, so after they've got a few years of experience, comes down to round about, depending how you measure this, 8 to 10%. Um, so we go from about 15, 20% women graduating from CS degrees and computers uh, and camps and stuff like that. And they drop out to, to about uh, 8%. Um, and you have, to under, you have to wonder why is that? Some of that is natural attrition. You know, they, they find it's not for them, whatever. They, they, they change to a different career. Uh, but a lot of it is due to pretty misogynist um, practices or just inbuilt, whatever it is. And look, I don't claim to fully understand it. All I know is the facts that, that people do drop out. And, um, and it, is, it is ugly. Uh, we don't know how to deal with it. We're trying, uh, but we probably need more help on, on this. <laughs> I'm just being upfront with you. you, know, you know, and, and, and to be clear, like I have a lot of friends who are women who are very successful in an industry. And once you're a successful woman, you're kind of like the token, like, yeah, here's a woman, here's a diversity. Uh, but that, it doesn't work like that, right? Like it's, uh, it's, it's systemic. Um, and we 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 have yet to figure out how to deal with it, and we're trying. Uh, but there are a lot of the parts of the computer science profession that don't think there's a problem. Sorry, was that too harsh? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I think I think you're like spot on. So as a girl who was trying to, who is trying to get into engineering, I've realized that like a lot of my experiences, I. I've been in, in a lot of situations where I would be the only girl. And so I think yeah. it's a part of that feeling of alienation because it is a mainly male dominated field. And another culture that I found is very like common within engineering as a field in general is this kind of obsession with video games. So how do you think video game culture contributes to the culture in the tech industry? Huh. Um, uh... I don't know where I don't know where exactly you're going with this. I mean, I can take it a few ways. <laughs> uh, so take first of all, like. okay. First of all, blanket advice: 
if you're thinking about going to game dev, uh, come talk to me first before you do that. Okay, it's a very stressful industry. Um, there's there's such there's there's what they call the triple A crunch. Like if you look at whatever top tier titles that you that you think about, like Gears of War or I don't know, like uh, uh, I'm like blanking on my games now. <laughs> but the game dev industry is notoriously bad. Uh, you, they you you um, j- just like the the amount of work life balance and, and the pay that you get for that for the skill that you have, you could be making much better money with way less stress in, in the other industries. The only thing that you should be working in a game dev uh, capacity for is you just really love games and you want that to be like, you want working on Spider-Man Miles Morales to be like your, your crowning achievement in life. And that's great. You know, I, I, I love Spider-Man, um, but like uh, the, 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 just the lives of people, like people have, you know, gotten, put themselves in really rough. Anyway, game dev, bad. <laughs> um, but but game programming, game game design uh, is, is permeating a lot of our culture. Uh, you know, we're in Discord right now, uh, and Discord spun out of game communities. And a lot of things that we develop technology for starts out because as a toy, um, uh, where we where we figure out all these things in a virtual world, and then we realize that okay, I can I can actually take part of this and and apply it for for other stuff apart from gaming. Um, so there are a lot of innovations that that come from gaming and actually uh, spread out to, to the rest of the, the world. Um, so, for example, the the technology that I'm primarily known for, React, um, in 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 the UI programming world, you know, you find you find you like just Google this, like the number of React engineers out there. There are like four million React React engineers, um, and they're some of the most highly highly paid front end engineers in the world. Um, takes its inspiration from game programming, the difference between immediate mode and retained mode, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we take a lot from, from, from games. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, where you want to go with that, but I just give you a few directions. <laughs> that was a really insightful answer. <laughs> I, I also wasn't too sure where I was going with that, but it okay. was like the, the like mutual kind of crowd obsession with video games because I find like a lot of young people yeah. especially go into software because they think like oh i love video games software must that's be that's fine for me yeah and so then yeah. i was like, because everybody in a lot of people in this industry kind of come from that same kind of pool kind of wondering like where does how does that have like a ripple effect in the industry and i think you answered that like really well especially the i fact think you yes yeah <laughs> Well, um, well, so so both Discord and Slack. So I don't know if you know this, but Slack was a spinoff of um, uh, what's his name, Stuart Butterfield. So he was trying to make an MMORPG, and he's been trying to do this for twenty years, but he's failing in, in building uh, billion dollar companies as a as a side effect. But he was trying to make an MMORPG, he failed, and he he was like, "Hey, we built this internal tool for for workplace chat," and that became Slack. Uh, and now it's a twenty-six billion dollar company, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of uh, game design comes uh, to to the way that we. I mean, think about what notifications are in Facebook and Instagram and like whatever. They're they're gaming you, right? It's 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 gamification, and people really hire game designers to design the experiences around you because your engagement, your attention is worth something to them, um, and that's obviously something that you should be aware of. Um, and it's good and bad, right? You can, you can use that to uh, build positive habits for, for yourself, but then you can also use that to uh, make, make a lot of people waste their time and money. Um, one, one, thing, one thing I guess uh, I'd say on, on like the game dev side, I think you may be over overemphasizing it because you see a lot of people around you ver- being very interested in games and that's the, the natural path in. Um, I was not one of those. And I think a lot of people like me are more pragmatic in the way that we approach software. Like, so the, my entry in was that I was in finance. I, need to, I needed to use Excel. There was a lot of number crunching in spreadsheets. Um, and at some point, you can't do that manually. You have to program it, right? So I had to learn VBA, which, which is embedded within Excel. And then at some point, VBA wasn't good enough because there are some memory limitations in Excel. So then you move off of Excel into Python, which is a more general purpose number crunching language. And once you go into Python, you realize that it's just a scripting language, doesn't have strong types, doesn't uh, parallelize, for, parallelize very nicely. So when I was trading, uh, financial derivatives, and I was pricing, uh, you know, pretty exotic options. I had to move to a functional language like Haskell. Um, in in uh, in New York, where a lot of the quant hedge funds work, they'll use a functional programming language like OCaml. Whatever it is, like 
we get there because we're trying to solve a problem. And it's not because we were, we're interested in a game. We just think that computers are very good tools to that. And they're the only way you need, you have to learn to speak the languages that the computers speak um, to get to the goal, which is you know making money or like uh, processing transactions, whatever it is you're trying to do. Okay, number one. This is all really, really cool. I think I think like this is more than just learning about like finance and tech. This is like learning both about finance and about tech. So this is really, really cool. Thank you <laughs> so much for all of this. Um, going off of that, actually, um, you said your end goal at the end of the day. Could you like walk us through like a typical day for you, like in yeah. your job? Okay. So so my job is um, very different from a typical software engineer job because now I'm sort of a head of department. Um, so, so <laughs> I know, thank you. Um, it's weird. It's, it's still a new job for me. So, you know, I may not be any good at this, but, uh, there's some amount. So at, so, in, you know, in the mornings, kind of looking over your calendar, like looking at how many meetings, uh, you have versus the, the projects that you have going on. Um, typically, you know, so I have three teams reporting to me, uh, documentation, uh, web engineering, as well as uh, SDK engineering. Um, and so I typically go through like the, the stuff that I need them to do. Um, so I, I might have like a one-on-one -on -one with one of my engineers um, or uh, you know, I might be writing on, working on my own proposal. And it's a very tricky thing to balance, uh, especially when you start managing people between um, how much time you should be focusing on the people that report to you versus the output that you individually need to produce yourself in order to be a credible leader for the team. Um, and especially compound all that. This is what you'll get in a management job in, in any tech company. Compound all that with the fact that the company is growing um, at rough, roughly the pace of like 100 to 200% a year. Um, so you're, you're also interviewing heavily. Uh, people are joining your team all the time. People have tensions with you or with, with their teammates, and you have to kind of step in and resolve that. Um, you have tensions because you're not the founder. Uh, I'm not the founder. Um, I have disagreements with my own founders uh, who are my bosses, but they also hire me to tell them what I think. So at what, at what point do you stand your ground? And what point do you say, no, it's your company. What you say, is, what you say goes. Um, so there's, there's a fair amount of that mix. Uh, and then the final piece is this is all internal. Like I just, I just told you about like just running the company. Uh, what, what do you do with the rest of the, your network outside of the, 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 the job? So I'm, I'm, Con con constantly like communicating with, um, you know, the people I used to work with, people I might work with in the future, um, <laughs> you know, just like friends in the industry, like uh, what's what's going on, what's the news, you know, checking Hacker News. That's a that's an often <laughs> that's a good distraction every now and then, um, and yeah, that keeps you fairly busy. You know, I do a fair amount of podcasts. Uh, I do something like twenty podcasts a year. Uh, I, do, I do a bunch of conference, industry conferences as well. I'm going to record a uh, conference later on after this uh, call. Um, and yeah, that, that's that's kind of it. You know, I, I don't have like a typical day beyond that. That's that's kind of the, the mix of things that we do in a day. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> so because we're here at a hackathon, we have like a lot of STEM hopefuls in this audience. So they're mm. interested from everything from coding to engineering. So what kind of skills would you say are the most important for someone interested in a job like yours? Um, I think engineering like is always a core skill. Like you need to know how systems work. You don't have to know every language in the world. You don't have to know every stack in the, in the field. Um, but you do need to know how to ask the right questions. Um, and so I always try to emphasize on, pe on people, um, because Google exists and Stack Overflow exists and Reddit exists, it's actually e pretty easy to get the, the answer to your question You know, if you try hard enough. The problem is asking the wrong question in the first place. If you do that, then you're never going to get a good answer. Um, and understanding the system well enough to ask the, ask the right question gets you a lot further than uh, if you just focus on the, 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 the just getting an answer all the time. I don't know if that's too abstract for you, but um, that's something I, I think a lot about. Um, yeah, so like once you get the base engineering skill done, so you know there's, uh, there's a typical career progression in, uh, in software engineering would start out something like uh, you know junior engineer or just regular engineer, and then you go to like engineer, depending on the size of company, like let's say you're at, at like a Microsoft, there'll be like engineer level one, engineer level two, you know, uh, 
and then you get to senior engineer. Uh, and then there are several levels of, of senior. So there's senior, there's staff, there's principal, there's tech lead, uh, there's distinguished engineer. And that's, that's, let's say, if you've been at Amazon or Microsoft for 20, 20 or 30 years. Um, and at some level, the amount of work that you do individually stops mattering as much as the impact that you can have on your team and then your uh, organization or your company. Uh, sometimes you step into an architect type of role where you say like, I I've worked on enough of these systems and I could do it, but that's not the best use of my time. The best use of my time is in designing systems and giving other people the shape of the job to do and let letting them have it. And they can come to me if they have any issues because I've done all this before. Um, so part of your job then becomes cloning yourself. Uh, and, that, and that's that's the best way to to uh, make an impact. Um, so yeah, I've just given you like it's this is a lot for someone who is not even in the field yet, <laughs> but there there is a progression, you know. Um, and I think uh, the, the baseline I would just focus on right, right now at, at the high school to college age is to just be able to ship uh, interesting projects. That's what you want on your on your resume. That's what you use to get hired. Um, and basically, anyone should be able to come to you with with a typical idea, as long as it's like in your field. Let's say you're in data science, or let's say you're in financial engineering, um, or in my field, I'm I'm in front end engineering. Uh, p anyone should be able to come to you with a typical project like Clone X, which is like a, a well known thing, and you should be able to broadly at least draw it on a whiteboard, but also just use popular frameworks to to get it done. And if you don't know how to do that, uh, then figure it out because self-sufficiency here uh, is a mark of someone who's who's capable. And that means that as an employer, I can hire you, hand off the task to you, and expect that you can mostly get it done uh, without assistance. Right? That's that's what you want to achieve. Self-sufficiency. <laughs> okay. And if you ever want to, you know, if you ever want to start a startup, that's also a very good thing, right? Because you, you're not going to have any guidance. Initiatives. Ooh. Yeah, lots of hot works here, guys. Okay, this is okay. This is honestly mind blowing. I feel like I'm learning more than I have in like the past six months. Shh, don't tell me that. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> so, kind of going off of that, um, you said that we should all have, um, like you just said, self sufficiency and just um, getting things done and like learning things. Um, what advice would you give for like us, your audience, just watching that? We all want to go into um, different fields, but like in general, tech. What did like? What's that one singular piece of advice that you would give? Um, wow, I, I feel like this is the prompt for me to give my standard advice, which is learning in public. Uh, this is what I'm known for. Uh, my <laughs> my most popular essay, which has been read by like a million people, <laughs> is uh, is this 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 thing called learning in public, um, and it's a fundamental shift in the way that you learn. So, unfortunately. The way that you learn in traditional school doesn't serve you very well in tech, and this is not not exclusive to tech, but it works really, really well for tech because it's so positive sum. We just talked about how tech is different from finance because uh, finance is very zero sum. Uh, because tech is so positive sum, when you share what you learn, people are incentivized to build with you um, and to and to recognize your work. Um, and this is very different from in in traditional schooling, where you study uh, and you, you compete to get, get the best grades. Um, getting the best grades gets you into the best colleges, and there's a limited spot space of that. Getting uh, you know, And coming out of the best colleges, you want to get into the best job, and there's a limited space of that. It's all very zero-sum all the way through. And you kind of keep what you learn to yourself, because uh, your goal is just to do better than everyone else. But once you drop that goal, it like just just realize it. No, no one cares. Okay, like I don't. No one cares what my GPA is. Okay, no one cares what degree I got. Um, they just care like if I can contribute to the field in a positive way. And I, ha I have built a, a good reputation of that, which is why I get invited to 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 speak at stuff. Like I, I have books that that I've uh, been an editor and, and published. Um, uh, that's just pu positive purely because you you contribute to, back to your community in a meaningful fashion. And no one cares what your degree is, <laughs> right? Um, b beyond that, um, so the way, yeah. So the the, the default way that you, that you that you've been taught to study is to learn in private, right? Like to to keep everything to yourself, to 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 have notes. You know, you've, like hopefully you write write them down, write them down somewhere and, and organize your your, your knowledge in, in some nice fashion. But you don't share them as a rule. Like obviously you could have like 
book clubs or whatever. I, I don't know what, you, what it is you kids do, but um, it, you don't share it that, that much. There's a, there's a set established syllabus. You study to it and success means you, you pass the exam. Uh, there is no exam in the real world. Um, there is no syllabus in the real world. You just, there's a vast open field of unexplored territory and it's your job to go map out the stuff that hasn't been, been mapped yet. And when you leave a map for others, they'll find that useful and they'll, they'll come follow along with you on that journey. Um, and it's a very positive sum because there's just unlimited amounts of things that we don't know <laughs> out there. So the, 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 the lesson here is to learn in public. Um, and uh, when, so this is, this is very much when you, when you, when you want to build a reputation, like when, when you learn in public, there are a few things happen. Um, one, you, you have a public record of your growth, your personal journey, and people and employers really like to see that, right? Um, if this beats an interview where you have to like condense everything that you are or uh, was or will ever be into a 30 minute like Zoom session, that's ridiculous. Like, wow, who made that thing? But like, if you had a, just a blog of just like, here's what I did for the last five years, go look it up. Um, there's just nothing you can fake about that. It's like I, I've, I've sat down, uh, I'll tell you, like my final day at Amazon when I was interviewing with them, um, I sat down, the guy was on his laptop and he was like, yeah, this is just a formality. I, I looked at your blog. That was it, you know, um, and, and that, that happens <laughs> more often than you think. So that's because it's proof of work. You know, it, you're no longer at an interview performing. You're just doing the thing and people can see that you do the thing because you did it in public. What, what better way is that is there than that? Uh, second of all, if you get anything wrong, and you will, right? Like a lot of people are like, ah, you know, I don't know everything yet. I'm not an expert, blah, blah, blah. Get it, get stuff wrong. Because when you get stuff wrong in public, people call you out because that's how the internet works. They, they, they like to yell at you from across the screen. Um, and when you get stuff wrong in public, it's so embarrassing that you'll never forget it. And so what, what's been lost? Your ego? No big deal. Um, and then finally, I think the, the, the big thing for me is the, the network, right? Like once you, you're planting a flag of like, the things that you're really interested in exploring just on your own, in your free time, people will come to you based on your interests. So this is a very different way of applying to jobs. So, so this is how people typically apply to jobs. Like they'll, they'll, like, they'll go like, I need a job. And they'll go onto some jobs board. And there'll be like 200 jobs out there. And they'll, they'll, they'll see if they think they're like, kind of fit themselves to that, to that job description. And they don't really know. And then you kind of go through the, the normal interviewing process. When you learn in public, um, people know what you're about. People know that this is the thing that you do for fun. And you're just really good at it just because like you spend all your time thinking about it. Then they come to you to hire you for that role, right? Like obviously, it does mean that you have to be known. You don't have to be internet famous. You just have to be known in the right circles. At the end of the day, you only need one job. So you have to be known in the right circles for doing the thing that you do well. Um, and then people come to you for with a U-shaped hole in it, and they, they ask you to fill it. Uh, and that's what that's how I got my current job. Um, a lot of like the last two jobs that I've had, um, I never considered myself qualified, um, but the companies approached me. And it turns out that <laughs> uh, this is a this may this statistic may be fake, but I don't. There's some amount of this that's true. Um, Eighty percent of jobs that people have are not publicly listed because they never get to that stage, right? You have to think about what happens when, what happens before a job is publicly listed on a job board. They look around first for people that they know, people that internally already in the, in the company that can do a lateral transfer. So you want to get to that point where you can access all these jobs that are never publicly listed because there are the secret, you know, really good opportunities that are perfect fit for you instead of doing the outbound search where you kind of see if you fit with, with the company. You go through the, the really standard 30-minute interview process. Uh, if you get past the, the one-page resume review, which everyone is like, oh, use this font or like position it this way. Uh, I'll tell you the last three jobs I had, the resume was the last uh, uh, the the last part of the the offer because they already made the offer they they just need it for for HR, um, so you want to get to a point where people either don't care about your resume or they know more than your resume. For example, I think Ale uh, uh, Ale <laughs> Alandra, uh, sorry, <laughs> your your name slipped me because it says it says Alexa Alexa Alexandra, but like uh, it's actually Alandra anyway. Um, Alandra actually put up my my own about site, so I purposely choose not to have a LinkedIn because I want to tell my story my way. And the only way people can get my story is on my about page. Um, and so like when it's, when it's the internet, like it's your rules, your, your, you know, 
yeah, your your game to play. Um, and so that's how that's the way I, I play this game. So that's my advice. I think I just ranted for like five minutes. It's all condensed into three words: learn in public. That was like an amazing rant, though. Like I. <laughs> Advice was things that like I'd never heard before, and yeah, it was amazing. I've been like, I've been I've been sharing this for three years, so I, I'm trying to get better every time I do this. Um, but thank you for letting me. <laughs> thank you for letting me. Um, <laughs> I love no, it. it, I love really it like, interesting. every time, every time people hear it, they're like, "Yeah, actually, like, why the hell do we do it the old way?" <laughs> right. <laughs> so somebody left a comment in the chat. It's a question from Mohammed B twenty three. So he asks, what's the best way for beginners like us to gain experience in the tech industry? And how can we grow connections with people that work in the tech industry? Oh, geez. Um, well, the first one is how can you gain experience? The second one is how do you, how do you connect? The first one is more traditional, uh, which is you, you do internships, you, you, you know, uh, especially look out for internships where uh, I, I think the big companies have this nailed down. So if you can get an internship with like Microsoft and Google, um, definitely go for that. Of course, it's going to be super comp competitive. So I'm, I'm don't bank on it. But um, I just think like that's that's like the best way to to do it. Um, you know, I, I I often like if you're in if you're in high school, you're, you're going to to a CS uh, undergrad. That's obviously like a really good path in, and you're you'll pretty much be be guaranteed a, a decent internship no matter what you do. Uh, for people who come to this path through another way, sometimes they struggle to find a, a, a job for a long time, uh, like a, a software engineer job. And so typically, I, I tell them to just join a tech company first in a tech adjacent role. So you're not expected to code, but you're expected to work next to people who code. So let's say you're like a support person. Uh, let's say you're like a community lead. You're you're like a marketing. Uh, person, and and you work next to them, and you learn, you pick up the skills along alongside, and it's much easier to transfer internally than it is to go in the front door, if you know what I mean. Because when people, when you have to, when you, when you apply through the front door, they have to put you through the standard interviewing processes. But when you're already working with them as a coworker, and you're just asking to switch roles to to do more, take up more coding stuff, um, then the only metric is whether they like you or not. That's, that's really it, <laughs> and it's a much it's a much easier bar. There's so many people who have, who have broken in that way. It's it's ridiculous. So basically, if you're if they're not letting you in the front door, go around the back, right? Like that's that's the long long short of it. Um, and uh, you don't need this yet to be. You guys are all too young. Like go just go just go straight for the front door. It's a much bigger door. Anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, the other thing about this is about networking. And the brilliant thing about about the internet. Is no one knows on, on you know on, this is the classic joke on the internet no one knows you're a dog, right? Like no one knows if you're a high school kid, you're like 50 years old, you're like super experienced. They they all just care. Can you help me? Uh, are you are you you know are you are you putting out positive vibes? Like when I look you up, like do you have experience? And like yeah, you know more experience helps you build that. Uh, but when you're when you're networking, it's all about like that mutual connection and of, of interest, right? Um, Sometimes it's an unequal relationship, so like a mentor-mentee type of thing. Uh, by the way, I generally tell people, do not ask for mentors. Like, do not go up to someone prominent in the industry and say, can you be my mentor? That's, a, that's an unpaid job with an unspecified length. Uh, and you're just telling him, telling him or her to give you advice uh, without any context, like absent, absence of nothing. I haven't bothered to listen to anything you, you said in public media. I'm just going to you and saying, can you, can you give me personalized advice? That's ridiculous. Don't do that, OK? Um, we get that a lot. And it's, like, it's, it's mean to say no, because like, they don't know any better. But now you know better. So I expect all of you watching to not do that. Uh, it's better to collaborate with people that you respect on specific projects, so limited term. Uh, things that they're already interested in and help them in some way that they cannot do themselves, right? Um, so I have actually collaborated with two college students um, on design and, and front-end work. Like, I've paid them as contractors, and they've they produced good work for me. Um, and I honestly couldn't care less that whether or not they were in college. This one, you know, one of them happened to be a sophomore in college. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they he could produce the work, so I paid him just like a regular person that, that would have paid you know, who, who was much older. I, I d d doesn't really matter. It's just, it's just about like, I had this, I had a need to do some, 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 some stuff and he volunteered. So I, so I just paid him. Um, and I think that's, that's a regular thing that you find in his fields. Uh, so I have an essay that I call pick up what they put down, which goes further into this concept. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
So we have five minutes left. So somebody in the chat asked, would you recommend working at a big tech company or a startup? And this is kind of like a speed uh, run since we're running out of time. So could you yeah. give us like a quick overview? Yeah, sure. Um, you can't go wrong working at big big codes um, because they because the reputation, uh, you know, it's, the reputation is accepted anywhere. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the weird saying, but you will never grow personally as much as you can at a, at a small company. So having been at, you know, an 800,000 person company like Amazon versus having, and currently now I'm at a 20 person company, um, I can say I'm just having a lot more fun at the 20 person company. Um, but, you know, having pri having been at the, at the at the big name company helps you get that instant recognition, right? P sometimes people when they when they get when they meet you, they don't know how to evaluate you, you know, just on on your on your merits alone. So having the shortcut of saying, "Oh, he's ex Google," or "She's ex Amazon," that's a nice shortcut. It doesn't actually mean anything. Like anyone who's been in that spot knows that it actually doesn't mean anything because you can't have bad Google and Amazon engineers. But it's just a shortcut. It's just it's like these these. these you know, they pass some random hiring bar. Uh, whereas when, when you're a startup that nobody knows, uh, it's, it's anything goes and it, it's purely based on your, your success at, at you know, fulfilling the, the, the company's needs. Um, so I, I do recommend people apply for, for big codes, um, but don't get worked up if you, if you don't get it. Because uh, the, the hiring is very random, <laughs> very, very random. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you can just do extremely well at a startup and never need it. All right, that was a beautiful, beautiful answer. I like that either personal growth versus kind of just like that name. I like that. I think that's yeah. something that a lot of people don't really um, and good money. I mean, can I talk money? Because we don't we don't talk money enough. Uh, so you guys should know how much how much we make. Uh, so a typical college grad, I think you'll you'll it's standard to make like seventy five to ninety k a year. Um, someone two to three years in the industry will probably make one hundred twenty to one hundred fifty k a year. Um, at Amazon, I made about 250 to two, uh, sorry, at Amazon, I made 260. Uh, and now I make less. I mean, I make 160 K, uh, but I also get options. So if the company does well, um, for example, if, if the company becomes a, a unicorn, like a billion, a billion dollar valuation, uh, then I'm making on the order of 1.2 million a year. Um, only if, right. D don't be so impressed because it's a, it's a bet, right? Like it, it could just not work out. Um, but that's, that's the kind of, uh, math that you have to, to do at this level. So would you stay at a big co for a reason of, for high base, but low variation? So like I would make around 300 K and if I stayed for a couple more years, maybe that would inch up to 400, 500 K or do I go for the smaller company where, you know, it could be zero, it could be, it could be huge. Um, but but I have more fun doing it. Maybe you know. It, it, there's there's a lot there's a lot of this math. But at least knowing you know, like the rough financial bounds helps you have an idea of do you want to go into this field in the first place. Um, so for people who are interested, go to levels.fyi. That's that's the site where you can see the pay scales of these companies. So that seems like a pretty a pretty like outright example of how like your experience in finance led you to oh, yeah. consider and stuff because you just called like oh working at a small tech company you don't know if it's going to like take off or not but it's an investment and i was just like i see i see your path yeah. so it does yeah exactly so, but, so you want to you want to um when you, like not all employers are created equal and you want to understand the business context of the company that you work at and this is this is not just software engineering this is all stem like whatever whatever fields you you, you work in you want to understand the economics of how people make money so because that eventually flows down to you um so yeah you, you definitely always want to keep that in mind and understand that oh my god okay i'm so sad we have run out of time wow. but this has been so amazing i know i took so much away from this based on all the comments in the chat a lot of people were super interested we got a lot of really good questions i don't i can't thank you enough for coming on today honestly this was amazing i think cat over there agrees with me <laughs> but thank you so so much this has been honestly really amazing do you have any thank you closing remarks for our that's my pleasure uh, uh you can email me uh you know feel free to put up my email um relatively open uh do not ask me to be a mentor uh, <laughs> but uh i'm happy to ask and you know answer any any uh sort of 
broad career questions. Um, if you if you want to sort of pay it forward, uh, write up something that you learned and tag me on Twitter with it, and I'll help you share that with the broader tech community. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, I'll be sharing his email on the Discord. Don't spam him, guys. Don't scare him away. <laughs> but thank you again so much, Sean. Thank you, Kat. It's a pleasure. Today. Have an amazing day. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have fun with the hackathon. See ya. Thank you.